questions. We've had a few questions that have come into uh, the chat box, uh, which have just had a run through there. Um, now, uh, looking at it provisionally, uh, most of them are actually uh, for uh, myself by the looks of it. But um, so please, if you have any questions for, for Paul and Bob, please get them into the chat box now. Um, I'm sure that they will be uh, very keen to answer your questions. Um, but whilst, uh, whilst that's happening, uh, I'll just run through the questions that we've had. So the first one I've had here is, uh, is Circle tied in with the local authority development plans in areas outside of Dublin? So uh, the point was raised there that they're currently being redrafted by most local authorities, which uh, is the case. Uh, obviously, in light of the housing for all strategy and the key targets, uh, each of the local authorities will be will be reviewing their their, their individual strategies. Uh, we do have very close working relationships with the local authorities. Uh, we are regularly meeting with them and talking to them in respect to those those strategies, uh, and we'll continue to do so over the course of the the coming months uh, and certainly throughout the course of this year because obviously it's important that we have a very clear understanding in terms of what their needs are. So, um, so yes, I would say we are, uh, we are involved in that. We don't have input into it in terms of the fact that we don't have a say in that. We can give them feedback in terms of uh, the opportunities that we have for delivery, uh, which hopefully they will take on board. Um, but ultimately it's really for us to take that information uh, and then utilize that when we're assessing the various developments that come forward uh, to, for us to look at. Um, Next question is, are the 500 homes per year linked to local authority targets or are they standalone circles, circle targets? Uh, they are linked to uh, the local authority targets. So, um, <clears throat> excuse me, to be clear, in terms of what circle delivers as a, an approved housing body, uh, all of our developments have, uh, have to be uh, approved by local authority in terms of the, the uh, housing needs for those particular local authority areas. So anything that we deliver lends to local authority targets. So we don't deliver anything in terms of private rental outside of that. That's not something that we, we do. Um, has Circle sought pla out outline planning permission prior to full planning permission? So, um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, so no, uh, we haven't done that. That's not some, uh, so again, I mean, uh, there'd be a certain degree of land banking that we'd have to do as an approved housing body. And again, um, you know, we are, uh, ultimately grant funded by the government. So it's not really something that as an approved housing body we're able to do. What we do do though, is we work with um, uh, developers, agents to identify sites that uh, have got good potential. Uh, we have conversations with the local authority about the potential of delivering on those sites should, uh, for instance, they need to be rezoned or whether or not uh, a planning approval could come forward. So, so we do have those early, very early stage discussions, I suppose, uh, with uh, local authorities um, in order to, to determine suitability of potential sites. Um, but we, we don't actually have anything that's pre-planning at this stage, no. Um, so is there a list of greenfield or brownfield sites Circle is targeting? So again, uh, we don't have a list of those. We work with agents and developers in order to identify sites that might be suitable. Uh, we don't actually keep a list of potentials, but our development team are actively out talking to developers, looking for potential opportunities, uh, also in terms of our own direct delivery construction, but also for the turnkey delivery uh, that we do with, with key partners. Uh, what type of construction contract is Circle using? So again, it depends on, uh, again, if it's direct delivery, then it will be a public works contract. Uh, if it's a turnkey delivery, then it will be a forward purchase development agreement that we typically use in terms of a contract. Uh, and then will Circle engage with developers that don't have planning permission yet and discuss the units that are needed? Yes, absolutely. So the point I made earlier in terms of, you know, we work with developers at those early stages, uh, you know, more than happy to have those early stage conversations. <coughs> Excuse me and uh, obviously assist in it, it, as much as we possibly can in terms of trying to bring sites forward to, uh, to, for delivery. Um, we appreciate that you know, finding suitable sites is particularly challenging um, and obviously any way that we can help in, in, in doing that, uh, we certainly will. Uh, and then the last question I had on here, and we have had others, so I'm just gonna have a quick run through those as well, is can the slides be shared? Um, I don't have a problem with our slides being shared. Um, I'll speak with both Bob and Paul. I'm sure both of them are nodding, not a problem. So uh, we can organize for that as well. Uh, so if you just bear with me a moment, because we've had a few additional questions and I'm hoping that some of them will be for uh, my two colleagues as well. Uh, so what can be done to encourage HP to engage more with infill sites and more difficult town centre projects rather than turnkey. Sector has great potential 
here to play a part in the town centre regeneration. Yeah, look, I genuinely agree. I think, um, you know, uh, town centre regeneration obviously is a central tenant within uh, the housing for all strategy. Uh, we do need to do a lot more in order to be able to try to uh, engage with those infill sites. We do, we do have conversations certainly with local authorities that have opportunities with infill sites. So there are expressions of interest that come out quite regularly in relation to those types of developments that are infill sites. And we have had and do have conversations with developers about potential infill sites. Typically, uh, you know, there is a certain degree of uh, remediation that may have to be done to those sites, which actually then tends to impact on the financial viability, which is really disappointing when, uh, and we've had one quite recently where we haven't been able to bring it all the way through to fruition because um, of the potential cost impact. But yes, I agree that, you know, it's something that needs to be looked at in more detail. Um, uh, I, I, uh, but I don't have an answer to that, unfortunately, but we're absolutely uh, keen to, to, to be able to do more of that type of thing for sure. Uh, another question there. Uh, uh, okay, so the slides should be on your screen. We, uh, we are showing them alongside the speaker. Oh, sorry. Okay. Uh, sorry, that's, <laughs> that was an internal question, so that's not really relevant to anybody um, <laughs> so, other than the panelists. Um, okay, the finance for developers, uh, is it available only for Ireland or all over the UK? So a question for Paul, I think. Yeah, well, certainly for us here in AIB, it's a 26 county brief, as I mentioned. However, we do have operations uh, in uh, Britain and Northern Ireland. So if the person who's asking that question wants to contact me directly, uh, I'll create um, that connection. I don't know exactly what way they do it, to be honest. I, I only know my own area, but uh, I'll gladly put them in touch with uh, somebody who could answer that question for them. Great. Thank you, Paul. Uh, okay, so the next question I've got here, do you seek future proofing housing, i.e. EV charging PV provision? So, so sustainability uh, is a huge part of what we do at the moment. So obviously, uh, you know, anything that's new build now has to be to an NZEB standard in terms of um, certainly larger developments or blocks of apartments that go for uh, forward for planning permission, there is um, typically less parking availability within those schemes, because that's a requirement. Um, more provision for, for bicycles. Um, Obviously, things like solar PV, um, use of renewables, air source heat pumps, et cetera, is, is, is relatively standard now in terms of design, uh, not necessarily always on houses, but certainly with it, within apartment blocks. Air source heat pumps, obviously, is, is something that's, that's used across the board. Uh, in terms of EV charging points, um, to be honest with you, I mean, it's, it's something that I think will become more uh uh, more relevant uh, and, and necessary is not something that we've done a huge amount of in past developments, but it's certainly something I know that we'll end up uh, needing to do. And we get more and more questions and, and, and inquiries about it these days. So, uh, so I suppose the short answer is yes, it is part of the provision, certainly part of the future provision anyway. Uh, do CVHA consider uh, commercial to residential change of use? <coughs> so, excuse me. Yeah, I think there's a huge opportunity around that. Um, I'm really, I mean, it, it, it's, it's sad in many ways because obviously the reason that, that there's a lot of opportunity around that um, is partly because of businesses that might have gone uh, out of business um, during the, the recent pandemic. But um, but yeah, look, I think, I mean, um, in, in prime locations, certainly in town centres, on the edge of towns, cities, uh, yeah, absolutely, that's something that we would look at. We have uh, looked at a few um, refurbishments for hotels, for instance, to turn into housing. Um, but I know that there's a lot more actually commercial uh, residential change of use tends to happen in the UK. I don't think it's something that's quite happening as much in the island at the moment. But again, I do think there is a, a big opportunity around that. So certainly something that we would we would consider. Um, again, I mean, uh, I'll just caveat that. Obviously, again, it comes down to subject support needs analysis. So um, ultimately, um, if there's a, a local authority need and there's support for it in terms of development, as long as it commercially stacks up in terms of its delivery, then you know we'll, we'll, we'll reasonably look at anything, to be honest with you, in that regard. Um, if a development is agreed to be sold to Circle, does this eliminate Part 5 requirement with the local authority? No. Um, so, local, uh, so Part 5 can be satisfied through a number of different mechanisms. <clears throat> so I, I say no in, in, uh, in the broad sense of you still have to engage with the local authority in order to demonstrate your compliance with the part five requirement. However, if all of the social housing within the development uh, is going, if all of the housing in the development is going to be social, 
then there is an opportunity to present that as being compliant with the part five obligations. Um, so, uh, it, and it also, I suppose, depend, depends on, on other developments that maybe the developers involved with elsewhere, et cetera. So that's always a conversation that has to be had with the local authority. Uh, is there a minimum size of contractor experience turnover to access AIB funding in partnership with CVHA? Uh, question for Paul, I think, please. Sorry, it, it, in partnership between ourselves and yourselves, is it? Uh, so I yeah, well, I, I suppose ultimately the question is, is there a minimum size of contractor experience turnover to access AIB funding? Uh, well, I yeah, probably... I mean, certainly uh, for my team, the minimum borrowing requirement is typically one million, um, but then it can go up to whatever. In terms of the experience piece, it comes back to that point I made about uh, assessing the development that's being undertaken with the team that's there. So uh, if somebody is, you know, has very limited experience, maybe done two or three houses, and all of a sudden there's a scheme for 80 houses uh, or for an apartment block, well, then we would question whether or not uh, the team has the requisite experience. But I think it's important to emphasize that we look at the overall team. So it's not just the developer, it's the other supports that are around that team. But uh, yeah, minimum, uh, typically 1 million um, as a borrowing requirement. And yes, the experience on schemes is a key factor that we look at. Very good. Thank you, Paul. Uh, question for Bob. Uh, how do you see the LDA working with AHBs? So for those of you not in the know, the LDA, uh, Land Development Agency. Yeah, so I think I just to broaden that out rather than speak on behalf of the LDA, I would say like clearly the issue when we've been talking to AHBs and indeed some of the local authorities is the availability of land for development. Obviously, the Land Development Agency have a very particular role there uh, and it's something that we're in discussion with the department around. I think it's really important given how much the AHB sector has ramped up since 2016 that we keep the momentum going by identifying pockets of land and service sites to, to move forward with. Very good. Thank you, Bob. Uh, so another question there, what uh, what level of profit on total cost as a percent would you like to see in appraisals? So I'll be honest with you, profit margins is the business of the developer. Um, I imagine that um, probably Paul might have a, a, a slightly different take on this. So from, from a circle point of view, ultimately, we understand you need to make it commercially viable. Uh, we want to see value for money. So that's, that's ultimately our key driver. Uh, Paul, I don't know if you've got a comment on that. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I wouldn't differ enormously in saying it is a matter for the developer. The only thing I would say is that what we typically see is in and around 10 to 12 percent as being the percentage that we're seeing on social housing schemes. Now, it can always depend what different you know aspects of the cost you're taking, et cetera. But the way we calculate it, it's typically between 10 and 12 percent that we see. But, you know, we take it on the basis of what the developers put in front of us. We don't have cutoffs as such, but the profit analysis is obviously a part of our overall analysis. Very good. Thank you. Uh, Paul, another question for you here. Are there requirements for security similar to normal loan agreements for long term funding? Long term funding, unfortunately, isn't my specialist area uh, there. That's my corporate banking colleague. So uh, for fear of misspeaking and, and being whacked over the head by them later on, if you don't mind, uh, if somebody has that question, they have my contact details, please send it to me. And again, uh, I, I'll get an answer for that person. Very good. That's great. Thank you. Um, and just follow up to that. Is there a potential for a discount on the lending rate? or fees if there is a significant ESG element? Well, obviously we've got very keen rates and, and, and fees and actually maybe just to take that on the chin first of all, and I will answer the ESG question. Um, typically we charge um, a margin of about four and a half percent when it comes to social housing schemes and there's a one percent arrangement fee and there's no exit fees uh, or commitment fees so that's the typical rates that we look at on social housing schemes in terms of the ESG piece the short answer is not at the moment and the longer answer is I'm actually working on something at the moment so the plan is that uh, we will be able to reward greater ESG involvement what we're anxious not to do is reward people for following the current regulations so what we're looking to do is structure something around 
what is materially better than the current regulations and maybe takes a more holistic uh, approach to the, the sustainability of the property rather than a narrow B or uh, view of things. So we are actually working on something around that and that would involve um, a, a price incentive for developers to be involved in that. Very good. Um, and then uh, another one actually for you, Paul, is the finance facility finance facility ring fence to the particular development is a requirement to provide personal guarantees? Yeah, actually, I'm very glad the person asked that question. Yes, typically we lend into an SPV structure uh, and all we look to is that SPV. We don't look for collateral security and we don't look for personal guarantees. But just to, to explain the reasoning why, and that is that we make the deal stack up on its own merits. And with social housing, you know, if you've addressed the development risk, uh, as we've kind of, as I set out there in the slides, and we've already got the sales risk as heavily mitigated as it should, that transaction should be able to stand on its own two feet. So no collateral security, no personal guarantees. We don't try to make, you know, a bad deal, a good deal, just because someone signs their name to it. We set it up as a good deal on the, its own merits. Very good. Thank you. Um... Just a, another question here for me, by the looks of it, strategically, does CVHA consider derelict properties, properties or is there a prohibitive cost limit? So um, actually, Circle delivered in the region around 80 homes through refurbishment of um, uh, older or derelict property, properties in the last two years. So it is something we have done quite a bit of in the past in terms of refurbishment. Um, I think in terms of regeneration of town centres, there's definitely going to be a need for that um, because obviously one of the big issues there is uh, is hollowing out of our towns, uh, and and obviously a lot of that is is uh, derelict properties in in town centre locations. So I would say it's not something that we we um, it's not something it's not something that we I suppose are actively pursuing as such, but it is certainly something that we would consider if a developer wanted to come to us with a proposal. Um, I appreciate though a lot of the time is actually uh, uh, more cost efficient to build new, and 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 largely that's that's the barrier to uh, to refurbishing derelict properties and obviously there's a lot of resource it's very resource intensive to do that um so i i suppose uh, ultimately it's not necessarily our preferred route um however uh, it's certainly something that I, I wouldn't cast out of hand it really does depend on what's being proposed uh okay what is the cost of finance is there an entry and exit fees and if so what's the percentage so another question for you there paul yeah that just harken back so typically four and a half percent margin 1% arrangement fee, no exit fee, no commitment fee. Great, thank you. Uh, question here for Bob. Uh, does he see supporting uh, supported housing, such as for the elderly being delivered through the model or more direct by AHBs? Uh, you, you suggested earlier, Bob, uh, that uh, there is a lag in delivery here. Yeah, so I'm not sure what model has been referred to there, but I suppose one of the issues definitely has been where people need supported housing is obviously not only lining up the bricks and mortar but obviously the funding for care and support and that's that's one issue the other issue i would say is there is a, like housing for all promotes mixed tenure communities which is about mixed income but we also need to look at the mix of types of people who are going to use those properties and we would like to see in larger developments and i think you'll see this coming forward a, an inclusion agenda that actually integrates housing for people with a disability uh, housing for older people and indeed uh, housing for, you know, for people uh, coming out of homelessness, particularly housing first into those overall developments. So we have integrated communities and clearly, you know, introducing housing for older people uh, adjacent to areas where people are aging can allow people to right size and can actually leverage more family homes, uh, potentially for people who need them as well. So this, I suppose, I just want to emphasize uh, that implied in housing for all is the whole area of mixed tenure and integrated communities. Very good. Thank you, Bob. And then just one last question here uh, for Paul, just to, to wrap up there. What are the current typical interest rates offered by AIB, please? Again, sorry, it's the same answer, four and a half and one, uh, four and a half on the margin, one on the, the, the fee. Um, yeah, that's it. Great. Okay, so... Uh, just by way of uh, thank you to both um, Bob and for Paul for their time 
uh, this morning. Really appreciate uh, the the input from both of you. And, and obviously, um, I think everybody would have found the information incredibly informative. Uh, thank you to all of you for attending. Uh, again, if you want to uh, contact us, we'll have contact slides coming up in just a moment so that you can take the information uh, and make contact, contact us contact us outside of the webinar. Uh, thank you all again for your time. And uh, we hope to see you again, uh, a similar webinar uh, in the future. All the best.